This plant is Brassica rapia. Now, it might not seem like much, but it's actually where our modern turnips come from. So how could we get our modern turnips, which have quite large roots, from this plant? Not only uh, do we get a larger yield from modern turnips, but it also probably tastes better and is more suited to the environment. So how do we take this plant and turn it into that? And that's exactly what we'll be talking about in this video. We'll be looking at uh, plant breeding. So more specifically, we'll be talking about uh, selective breeding, hybridization, and genetically uh, modified organisms. My name is Teal Simmons, and this is Agriculture Explained. In this video, we'll be specifically looking at three different ways we can change our plants genotype. So that the first one is being selective breeding, next one hybridization, and then uh, genetic engineering. So we'll be looking at all these different strategies, uh, the positives and negatives for each, and why we would consider using one over the other. So before we get into our different strategies, it's important to understand why we would actually want to change our plant's genomes. Well, it all comes down to increasing the value we get from our plants. So what do I mean by that? We're basically wanting to increase either the quality that our plants bring us, the yield that they can make, or make them uh, more resistant to the environment, and that's uh, environmental adaptation. So firstly, quality. Uh, anything that the consumer demands, so us going to Woolies, why would we want to pick a certain um, tomato over the other? That is uh, consumer demand. So we might want to choose one over the other because of flavor. We might prefer uh, this one because it's more flavorful, uh, flavorful or the shape, anything like that. That's the quality. So flavor, nutrients. Now, if we can make a... Uh, a fruit or a plant more desirable to the consumer, they will be willing to pay more for this. So as a farmer, we would be able to increase, um, I guess our profit margins and bring in more money. Next, yield. Yield, we can increase, uh, I guess, what we can produce. So for example, on wheat, if we can make a bigger seed head, we can increase the amount of um, wheat produced per hectare, and then that's gonna increase our supply, increase our, um, income so we can make more money make more money it's pretty much uh increasing our uh, i guess profits and income at the end of the day and that's really why lastly we have uh, environmental adaptation so this is pr um, protecting or making our plants more resistant to uh, the environmental factors so heat if it's a really hot day we want plants that can survive those really hot days if we're in say australia where it's, it's quite hot most of the time we want plants that can survive in these areas. So we're going to breed our plants to be able to survive in like drought uh, conditions. Also disease, if we can make our uh, plants more tolerant to uh, certain diseases, we're going to in, uh, allow them to, I guess, increase their yield and quality as we're not gonna um, constrain them by having disease. So plant breeding boils down to uh, increasing certain uh, factors in our plants that make them more desirable. So uh, quality, yield, or adaptation to environmental factors, all of these will uh, allow us to have more productive plants. And then at the end of the day, it will support uh, our business by making more money. So before we get into our plant breeding, I think it's really important that we just brush over some basic genetics. So firstly, an organism has half of its genetic material from its um, father and then half from its mother. So as you can see here, this is our, um, say a parent organism. Represented in pink are the uh, mother's chromosomes, and then in blue are the father's. When that organism wants to uh, make some offspring, it'll produce uh, either an egg or a sperm, depending if it's a um, female or male. But what goes into that um, gamete is, so they're called gametes, what goes into that is um, half of its genetic material and what chromosome that goes into it is completely random and independent of the other chromosomes so this one is going to be uh, the mother's chromosome this one the father's uh, and then this one's the father's now that is a completely random process and it will change for each uh, gamete that combines with another organism's gamete to produce an offspring now on each chromosome uh, um, genes. A gene is a characteristic that 
uh, an organism will express. So each parent will contribute one allele, which is a variation of that gene to the organism. So the mother contributed a tall uh, allele and the father contributed a tall allele. So overall, this organism will have a, uh, a tall um, gene. However, with the eye color gene, the mother contributed um, blue eyes, whereas the father contributed brown eyes. So what happens when we have two different alleles? Well, basically the alleles will almost uh, fight over um, each other to be expressed. So one allele will be more dominant over the other. Say in this example, brown is, the offspring will um, show brown eyes. It's not all about our genes that we have that will tell us exactly uh, what characteristics will show, but rather that it's our um, genotype, which is all of our genetic makeup. So for this individual, it will be tall, tall. So it's the alleles um, that are um, expressed. So it's interaction with the genotype and the environment that will give rise to our phenotype. So uh, the environment is uh, abiotic and biotic factors. So non-living factors such as um, temperature, the climate, biotic disease, living things. Um, so it's an interaction between our environment and our genotype that give rise to our phenotype. So what we physically look like, phys physical characteristics um, of the organism. So for example, the uh, height of a uh, organism isn't purely expressed by uh, the alleles it has. Say it has two really tall alleles. Now, if that individual doesn't get enough nutrients, so nutrients uh, is, say, one of our environmental factors, it won't be able to grow to its full um, capacity. So we could almost say that our genotype sets the bar, sets the maximum limit that um, an organism to grow to or to live up to, and our environment allows um, a certain amount of that to be um, lived up to. So another example, say you have a calf that has uh, a parent which is uh, really fast growing and another parent that's really fast growing, you'd expect that that uh, calf to grow really fast. But say you got a, a disease while it's quite young, that could set it back and prevent it from living up to its really fast growing genotype. So where this comes into play with our uh, plant breeding is that Plants with genes that we really like and that we want to, I guess, breed for, so say a, um, a larger leaf on a lettuce plant, say we want to um, express that more and more within a plant. We're going to take plants that have, say, a uh, allele for a large um, lettuce leaf, and we're going to pretty much try and breed that with another plant that has a large lettuce leaf. So that makes uh, understanding this process is really important because each parent needs to have um, contributed a large lettuce leaf gene. So understanding these three concepts are fundamental in order for us to understand plant breeding. So lastly, the amount of a um, trait contributed by the genotype is termed heritability. Now this means that the environmental factors won't, con won't contribute to that factor as much. Now that we know a little bit about uh, genetics, we now need to know a little bit about reproduction in plants. So there's two ways that uh, plants pretty much reproduce. The first one is cross-pollination. Cross-pollination is where plants will pollinate with other plants. So an example of this is corn or um, pumpkins. Now on these plants, there are two separate uh, flowers for the male part and the female part. So what will happen is that the pollen from the male flower will fertilize uh, the female flower. So the second way that plants can reproduce is self-pollination. Now self-pollination is where plants will pollinate their own flowers. Now this is a form of inbreeding for plants and it's tricky for plant breeders to overcome as plant breeders will want these self-pollinating plants to cross-pollinate. So what plant breeders will do is that they'll remove the anther from the male part of the flower. So that's the part that's containing uh, the pollen. And then, uh, so remove that so they get a uh, almost a female flower. And then, so then they'll take the pollen uh, and then pollinate other uh, flowers so that we essentially get a um, cross-pollination effect. So now that we've got all that background stuff out of the way, let's get into uh, plant breeding. So one of our first techniques is selective breeding. So this is uh, selecting plants with our desired um, characteristic. 
uh, and then breeding from those. So we uh, increase the frequency of uh, those characteristics. So to do this, it's pretty much four simple steps. We select our plants that we want to uh, breed from. Now these plants already have to have this desired trait. Next, we're going to allow them to uh, cross pollinate. Thirdly, we're going to then select um, the plants with this desired trait from the offspring. We're going to let them grow and then we're going to repeat. What will happen over time is that each generation um, and each generation after that will increase their, I guess, that characteristic that we uh, desire from them. So um, I've drawn up a, a quick diagram, I guess, to, to express this. This is our parent generation, so the very first um, generation of plants that we start with. Now you may see that these guys have a bit of a green uh, color on them, but they're predominantly red. Now we want to breed uh, this plant so that um, most of it is green. So what we're going to do, we're going to allow these guys to cross pollinate and then we get our um, first cross generation or um, gener uh, uh, F1. So uh, now if you remember back to um, the basic genetics, the genes that these guys have, now some of them are going to have genes that um, express the uh, green characteristic and we want that green characteristic or the green gene to uh, be more predominant in the next generation. So what we're going to do, we're going to allow them to breed, but we're only going to take plants in our uh, F1 generation that have uh, more green characteristics. So we're going to get rid of these really red um, plants there, we're only going to breed from the green plants. So we're going to take these ones, we're going to allow them to cross pollinate and get our F2. Now in the F2, they're even more green. So we're going to get rid of the, um, I guess the lesser um, ones and we're only going to breed from these really green ones. And we get um, F3, which is even more green, and then finally F4, which are mostly green. So if we do this over generations and generations, like um, 10 to 15 years, we can almost change complete, uh, the, the plant completely. So this is the main idea of selective breeding, where we, we're taking a uh, plant with a desired uh, characteristic, or a group of them, allowing them to cross pollinate, and then only selecting the ones that have um, more of this characteristic. So what are the negatives and positives of selective breeding? Well, firstly, one of the advantages of selective breeding is that we're going to get improved varieties. So as we said before, we're going to improve quality, we're going to improve yield, and we're also going to improve um, environmental adaptation. So firstly, we get improved varieties, and not only that, we get improved varieties that we want. So we're going to be breeding for a specific trait that we want, um, and so that is um, one of the advantages. Next, we get increased yield. Now that comes with the uh, improved varieties. And lastly, selective breeding is one of the more uh, natural ways of um, changing the genetics of our plants. When compared to hybridization and genetic engineering, we find that selective breeding is more, one of the more natural ways of uh, changing genetics. Now, uh, it's mainly because we're not actually changing, I guess, uh, anything about the plant. We're just controlling uh, what plants breed with what. So in a way, we're almost controlling evolution um, or breeding. And so in a, in a way, it's, it's more natural. Now there's always disadvantages to everything. And so the disadvantages to selective breeding is that it can cause a uh, loss of genetics. Now, if we're breeding um, for a certain uh, genetic trait, we're going to be uh, losing some. So for example, uh, if we're breeding for a really tall plant, we're going to, we're not going to want genetics that breed for a short plant. So we're going to pretty much get rid of the short genetics and uh, increase the tall genetics. So what that means for further impact of agriculture and ecology might be that we are losing traits that we could potentially uh, want. So um, say we, we may actually want a shorter plant for some um, operation, but by just not having that gene, it reduces our options of what we could potentially do in the future. Now it is possible to, I guess, uh, almost selectively breed back to a variety. Um, but it, it won't ever, I guess, be the same. And, and depending on what genes uh, you have, it might be a different mutation. So it all depends, but essentially we're going to lose some genes. Next is that uh, selective breeding takes a really long time. It might take tens of years to um, develop a new variety. So it won't happen tomorrow and we've got to put a lot of uh, time and investment into developing these new varieties. 
So that means that if we have a problem today, we can't rely on selective breeding to solve it tomorrow. And then we also get those associated costs uh, and time um, with developing a new variety. Finally, we've got a ethical, uh, I guess, disadvantage is that are we actually um, acting as God? And I guess this is up to your own ethics, but some people say that yes, we are by changing the um, genetic frequency, um, we're acting as God. But there's also the um, argument that, well, if God allowed for these, uh, I guess, management strategies, is it allowable for us to um, to undertake them? So it, I guess it is up to your, your own uh, ethical stance on these things. So finally, we've got some examples of selective breeding. So rust resistant wheat, they've um, selectively bred a rust resistant gene for, for wheat. And lastly, most of our vegetables and flowers are actually selectively bred already. So if you, if you remember the intro to the video, we had the wild turnip. Now, how we go from that plant to uh, a turnip that we have today um, is all thanks to selective breeding. But you'll find that a lot of our uh, plants and, and um, flowers that we have today are all um, selectively bred. So it is very hard to find a, a wild type plant that we can um, to use and sometimes they're not even viable in, in agriculture. So that's selective breeding. It is essentially just choosing uh, genetics that we like in plants and making sure we breed from them. And as a result, we're gonna get better plants that are gonna yield more uh, and then help our uh, production pretty much. Our next plant breeding method is hybridization. So hybridization is quite simple. It's just the breeding of two inbred lines. Now, as a result, we're going to get a hybrid vigor offspring. So hybrid vigor meaning that we get um, characteristics from both parents. So to do this, firstly, we select our plants. So these plants have to have the desired trait already in them. Then we're going to allow them to self pollinate for about um, eight to 10 generations. Now this is important um, because it allows the, I guess, lethal recessive genes to pair up and then that plant will die. So in the end, we're only gonna have plants with pure lines. Now, what this means is that the alleles on each gene, so remembering back to our um, genetics basic, basic um, part, we're only gonna have plants with alleles on the same genes that are the same which means, um, so a tall gene with a tall gene and brown eyes with brown eyes. So all of the alleles in that plant are going to be the same. So as you can see here, this is uh, an example of uh, two chromosomes. All the um, alleles are the same. And that's what we call uh, a pure line. So we're going to now cross two uh, inbred lines or I guess our, our pure lines with um, the other to get this hybrid vigor. So back to the genetic part again, remember how we get one chromosome from each parent. So we're going to get one chromosome from uh, one plant and then another from the other. So what will happen is that the best parts of one plant will be given to the offspring um, and then the best parts of the other plant as well. So we get, uh, this is jump for, uh, jumping forward a bit, but we're going to get a um, genotype with a mix of both uh, both of the best characteristics but also the worst. So um, I drew a diagram here uh, to really drive in the point of hybridization. Then you let the plants uh, self-pollinate or inbreed for eight to ten generations so that's that. Now you'll notice that uh, two of these are crossed off this represents them dying so they're going to get a lethal recessive gene causing them to die. Now for the program this is good because it gets rid of these lethal genes. We don't want them in our, in our um, I guess, end plant because that's a, uh, that's a, a cost to the system. Like we, don't, we don't really want that. We only want the, the beneficial genes. So we're gonna get rid of these um, non-beneficiary genes and then we get out to inbred lines. So an example um, is, so this plant is going to produce a really large leaf, but this plant is going to grow really quickly. So then when we cross these two lines together, we're going to get offspring that firstly produce really large leaves, but then grow really quickly. So we get the, um, the benefits of both in the offspring. And that's, um, I guess, represented down here in the um, chromosomes where we have the chromosome of one and the other. So it's important to know that both of these parents are homogeneous, which means that both of the alleles on each gene are the same. So this down here, but each parent is uh, different in its uh, alleles from the other. And then when they cross over, they produce heterozygous 
uh, offspring, which will have uh, the combined benefit of both. Now, this is a really important note for hybrid species. Now, because they are uh, heterozygous, it means that any offspring that these guys will produce won't be the same. They'll be worse off um, than these guys. Now, that's because if we now try and cross these genetics over, we're going to either uh, recess back to uh, the parents or we're going to get crossing over a curve and it's going to make uh, almost a, a genetically worse plant. Because of this, every time we want to grow a crop of these plants, we have to buy uh, the seeds from uh, the growers. The ability to develop a hybrid vigor from two separate lines is very advantageous for our hybridization method. Um, so that allows us to take two desired uh, characteristics from two separate um, plant lines. And then this will allow for an increase in production and then you know, increase yield, increase profits pretty much for our business. But there are some catches. So first of all, we get uh, some loss of genes uh, from the development of uh, these varieties, but also uh, we can't breed from uh, the hybrid plants. And this will cause us to um, buy more seeds when we want to uh, grow them again. And this can cause uh, increase in uh, expenses um, and the likes. But then again, if we're increasing our production, increasing our yields and profits, then it's uh, almost okay to take on a little bit extra cost to get that um, more production, as long as it works out better than what it was um, without it. And again, we also get that ethical um, concern with hybridization. Are we playing God? Is it uh, a uh, moral? Is it morally okay to be changing almost the genetics of our plants? But overall, we get a massive uh, efficiency again with hybridization. Some examples of this are corn, wheat, barley. So most of your, uh, most of your plants um, that you can get uh, commercially are um, hybrids because we get this massive beneficiary uh, hybrid vigor characteristic. Now for the infamous genetic engineering. So what is genetic engineering? Well, it's pretty simple idea and all we're doing is inserting genes into uh, a plant's DNA. Uh, and essentially that's all it is. So we need to identify um, a gene that, that we want. Um, so we'll be talking about BT cotton in this uh, example. So we've got to identify um, almost a problem first. So in uh, the cotton industry, there was um, a bullworm, which is uh, a worm, it's a really bad pest that uh, used to damage all the cotton crops. And so they found a, um, a bacteria in the ground, or here the bacteria in the ground that produced this uh, insecticide that actually killed bullworm. And so scientists thought, well, if we can take this insecticide gene in the uh, bacteria and put it into uh, cotton, then the cotton can produce in this insecticide and then we've um, effectively produced our own uh, insecticide from our plants, which solves our uh, bullworm problem. So firstly, we have to identify the gene. So in this case, it's the insecticide producing gene. We need to isolate it. So um, we need to know, I guess this is getting a bit technical, but we need to understand exactly the um, sequence which codes for this gene. So that takes a fair bit of, I guess, uh, testing. A bit more lab work, but essentially got to isolate the gene. So we can, uh, we can cut it with restrictor enzymes, then we can clone it. So this takes uh, place in uh, PCL or pr polymerase chain reaction. Um, and then after that, it will produce uh, a heap of these uh, genes. And then we've got to transfer it into the plant. Now, um, this can either be a number of different ways, but a lot of the time they use um, viruses and then the virus will inject it uh, into the DNA. But all of these, all of these processes are quite uh, technical when you get into the specific details. But in general terms, this is almost all that they're doing. So they take, yeah, so they take the, the gene that has the insecticide from the bacteria. So the, the gene's already there. So we're just taking the, the DNA from the bacteria, finding the specific gene that codes for the insecticide. We're taking that, we're multiplying it, and then we're going to insert it into the cotton uh, DNA. Even though we are changing the DNA of the cotton, we're, we're not coding it, uh, say, ourselves. So we're not making up the genes ourselves from a lab. We're not figuring out what gene would code for a, um, an insecticide. We're taking the insecticide from bacteria itself, which is already present in, in the soil. And we're just taking a, a small snippet of that, and then we're putting it into um, 
uh, another plant. In terms of the impact of this new technology, it has massive uh, benefits to reducing insecticide use. So um, since I think the introduction of beta cotton, the uh, use of insecticide for cotton production had reduced by 97%. Um, so that's a massive decrease. And now if you're thinking about, I guess, the environmental impacts of that, reducing your insecticide use by 97% is a massive um, reduction in insecticide use. And that will, that will really um, benefit your beneficiary insects. So just by, I guess, inserting this gene, where supporting the um, population of your yeah, insects minus bollworm but that's um we don't want that anyways genetic engineering of plants can highly increase our production now we saw this with um, bt cotton by allowing the cotton to produce its own insecticide it um, prevents the um, bollworm from i guess uh attacking the plant now this allows us to almost passively control the um, pest we don't have to go spraying it and so we're going to increase the quality um, and quantity of our cotton also a uh, advantage over some of the other um, uh, plant breeding strategies even though this is not plant breeding but it's um, i guess all class in one of those methods is that it takes a much shorter time to develop these varieties even though we may be looking at a couple of years it's much faster than um, breeding plants over generations and generations and then again, we're going to increase our yield, but also it, it may have um, significant impacts on the business financials. So with BT Cotton, we're going to not be spending any more money or um, reduced amount of money on uh, insecticides. So um, that's going to significantly increase our, our profit margins, which will um, improve, I guess, profit. But there are some significant risks um, and disadvantages when it comes to genetic engineering. First of all, ethics. Um, should we be playing with um, plant or animals uh, genomes and DNA? Um, you can make your own mind up about that, but also unknown consequences. Now, this is probably um, the biggest one. With the new technology, we may not know uh, to which extent this may affect us. So BT cotton might be a bad uh, example for unknown consequences, mainly because we're not eating it ourselves. Uh, it'll just go into the clothes that we wear um, and you know, we're not going to, I guess, get sick from an insecticide that the plant produces on cotton that we're going to wear. But if you uh, use, say, a, um, a gene that increases a certain hormone in a plant that increases growth and we eat that, well, what are the consequences of that on our health and is it going to have any negative consequences? So they're the kind of, uh, I guess, consequences we have to be thinking about when it comes to implementing new technologies and definitely genetic engineering um, because the field of um, genetics is growing and we don't know everything about it. The development of genetically modified organisms are pretty expensive and so we might not see a, a very good return in the first couple of years of development but after that the, uh, the cost of de development is pretty much uh, none as it's already developed. Now, this is uh, almost uh, disadvantages across all different methods because all the, I guess, expenses of development are before the product is released. So once the product is released, um, you almost have uh, very little costs in terms of development and it's all going into production. But I guess that's a, um, a disadvantage for that. In terms of some examples, we got um, Bulgard 3. So this is a, a BT cotton. It's a newly developed uh, BT cotton where we um, actually have three different genes that um, code for insecticides. So the reason why they're using three is because they found that some of the um, uh, bullworm was developing resistance to just the single insecticide. So if you have three different ones, it's, it's harder for the bullworm to develop resistance against one particular um, gene or the insecticide. Another example is we have uh, Roundup Ready um, so canola or cotton, different um, plants. So this allows Roundup to be applied to the plant and it actually won't affect the plant. So it will kill all the weeds around it, but it won't damage uh, the plant. Finally, another example is golden rice. Now golden rice is a pretty interesting one because it takes some genes from bacteria and uh, dandelions to pretty much allow rice to produce vitamin A. And so what this will allow 
is for uh, countries or regions which are highly vitamin A deficient to pretty much get a really good source of vitamin A in rice. And so this has some really good implications for global health. And so in terms of what method is best, it really depends. Uh, and we shouldn't really look at these uh, methods as uh, what one's best and what one's worst, but really as a collective tool and things that we can use uh, to develop new um, varieties. But all of these methods improve the genetics of our plants so that we can increase um, production and even potentially improving the sustainability of these productions by uh, improving, say, water efficiency um, or the efficiency of the production. So we're not wasting um, as much and we're going to be, I guess, produ uh, producing more from what we have. So there we go. That is how we take a plant like this and uh, completely change it into something uh, that's a bit more suited to our uh, agricultural production. So remember, we have uh, three different types of uh, ways we can change the genotype in our plants. We have uh, selective breeding where we're uh, taking the genes that we really like or characteristics that we really like in our plants and then keeping that breeding from those plants so that we increase those characteristics. We also have hybridization, which is the uh, crossing over of two inbred lines. This will produce a hybrid vigor, which is uh, really uh, quite beneficial to uh, production as it contains both of the uh, best characteristics from both of the parents, but as well as the worst. And then finally, we have our genetically modified organisms, which we insert a gene into the genome, which is from another organism, and then get that um, plant to start producing different proteins and so that's the basics of plant breeding i hope you learned a lot from this video if you did make sure to share it with someone um, you know that would gain a lot also check out some of our other content we have uh, other videos on plant production animal production and we even have a series on regenerative agriculture so check that out make sure to subscribe uh, also on facebook so check us out there thanks for watching my name is till simmons and this is agriculture explained